Welcome back to Reimagine 2020. I'm Yona Hockhaus, and today I'm glad to be joined by Evan Quo, co-founder of Ample Fourth. Evan, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Yona. I'm glad to be here, and uh, I see you're wearing a costume for this Halloween-themed interview. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I know it's not a very scary costume, but this is what I had around the house, so you'll have to forgive me. Uh, if it, right. If it might be scary interview. if you stand up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to sit. I'm going to sit. Keep yeah. The, the camera tilted <laughs> upwards. Um, right. So, yeah, Evan, so for those who, who haven't seen any of your past interviews, who, who might not know you, you want to give a, a little background on kind of who you are and how you got into blockchain? Yeah, totally. So um, my background is in engineering. I went to school at UC Berkeley to study kind of mechanical engineering and also computer science. Got more and more pulled into that direction of robotics. Um, but then, you know, after graduating, quickly went into the startup world. Um, and eventually kind of uh, teamed up with my co-founder, Brandon Isles, who's also kind of a computer scientist. So he's more of a, a, a Google search engineer. Um, and around the time of uh, 2017, after Ethereum was really taking off, um, we started to kind of think about what sorts of applications of blockchain technology might be interesting to explore. Um, we had both been introduced to Bitcoin years prior. We both kind of didn't fully uh, believe you know, it would be as revolutionary as it was and found, found it interesting. Um, and anyways, we kind of came to this mutual conclusion that the most salient application of blockchain technology was the creation of new monies and then began a journey by asking what sorts of new monies ought to be created or can be created with this new technology. Um, and in, uh, in particular, we were interested in non-collateralized currencies like Bitcoin, as opposed to redeemable collateralized currencies like Tether. Um, anyways, uh, Ampleforth is a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, except for um, the number of units in your wallet can increase or decrease and does so each day based on price exchange rate. So it accepts uh, price as an input, uh, as a proxy for demand. If there's more demand than supply, then we increase the total supply of Ample directly to user wallets and proportionally. Uh, and if there's less um, uh, demand than supply, then we decrease the quantity of units uh, proportionally from user wallets. And uh, the design of this cryptocurrency was actually meant to address the limitation of fixed supply commodity monies like gold and Bitcoin. Um, and along the way, uh, we kind of, uh, we worked, we were funded by, a, you know, uh, really kind of reputable VCs and we're also advised by two members of, um, the Hoover Institute, which is a political and economic think tank at Stanford in their independent capacities. And anyways, um, long story short, upon further analysis, um, we also realized that this new kind of incentive mechanism or protocol um, might introduce a different movement pattern into the space. And so that's really interesting because um, most of these cryptocurrencies are very, very, very tightly correlated. Um, and it makes it difficult to kind of make them useful in baskets of collateral assets or to construct, you know, um, robust systems on top of it. And so two things, one, we designed it to address the limitations of fixed supply of money. Um, and, and two, we noticed that uh, and hypothesized that it might have a novel movement pattern that could allow it to decouple from assets like Bitcoin, which makes it useful for diversification and basket of, of crypto assets. So that's kind of ample forth in a nutshell. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it does seem like a like like, like, a, like a great idea. It does addressing those problems. Now, you, you mentioned uh, you know obviously manipulating the, the, the price by supply and demand, classic uh, basic economic uh, uh, principles there, but uh, how do you actually uh, change the, the uh, amount or, or the value uh, in the actual wallet? Do do, does the one need to hold it in a, in a special wallet? And, and what, if, what if I'm keeping my Ample in cold storage? How does your network reach that? Right. That's a really great question. Actually, that's the, the kind of the one technical breakthrough here um, that we take advantage of. And it's uh, that the, the Ample Fourth protocol is able to increase or decrease supply across all wallets proportionally without a transaction between peers. And the way that happens is, but we adjust this kind of global coefficient of expansion, if you will. Um, and by adjusting that single variable once every day, and it's actually not we who do it, but the protocol does so once every day automatically, um, you know, the number of units in all wallets, whether they're in cold storage um, or not, uh, increase or decrease. Now, 
if your wallet or if your ample is being held on an exchange, then the exchange tends to pool these wallet addresses. So the on-chain wallet um, quantities will automatically increase and decrease according to the protocol. Uh, but if somebody is custodying your assets and they pooled it, then it's the responsibility of the custodian to make sure that the accounting is is up to date. You know, because if your if your amples are in exchange, really what's being reflected in your balance might be just some entry in a database, not what's actually directly connected to a wallet. Uh, because they pool wallet addresses and and therefore the certain exchanges that have integrated ample have you know essentially propagated that accounting um into into the wallet balances or the balances that are displayed to users but yeah it kind of happens automatically so that that's kind of the novel thing we've never in the past been able to do that like increase or decrease the quantity of units in people's wallets without a transaction between peers and that's what allows us to happen in a scalable way with just a single transaction per day um, and so, yeah, that's cool. It's elastic and it's also non-dilutive. I forgot to mention this earlier. Um, like Bitcoin, um, if you own like 1% of the Ample network and let's say the market cap is $10, um, you have a dollar worth of Ample and then suddenly the market cap grows to like $100, you still have 1% of the network. You'll just have more Ample, right? Ideally, you will, you'll have something like 10 out of 100, right? So the number of Ample you own will multiply but um, or decrease but your percent ownership will remain fixed unless you actively buy more or so. And, and so just to help uh, the viewers visualize this, essentially that coefficient that you're changing, it'll be like, let's say I have one uh, ample in my wallet. So that coefficient is, let's say three. So my wallet will actually only represent one ample, but once it actually interacts with the network, when I actually go to spend it or, or buy it, it, it then goes, all right, now it's like I have three, value uh, of three, uh, whatever that coefficient is, it actually only affects the ample my wallet wants to actually try to utilize it on the network. In a way, yes, um, except for, I mean, if you want to get more specific, what happens is we overwrite the public interface balance of, that's a function, that's part of the ERC-20 kind of um, protocol um, or the specification. And when you query balance of, actually we overwrite m multiple functions, like so transfer, approve, transfer from, and balance of. And these are the public interfaces for uh, what returns a balance or what allows you to initiate a transfer or approve a transfer and so on and so forth. So when you plug your, um, your like nano into your computer and it returns a balance, it does so by querying balance of. There is no greater source of truth in terms of what your balance is other than what that method returns. And um, that method takes into consideration this global scalar you know, coefficient of expansion in, in determining a balance and returning it to you. And, and therefore it's not like, yeah, there is no lower layer. Your, balance, your wallet balance is what balance of returns. Right. And um, in the case of Amples, that you know, uh, takes into consideration this coefficient of expansion. And so just like anything else, it's like you plug it in um, whether you're, you're transacting or not, um, the balance changes are reflected. You mentioned that it's not that we, not, not that we, it's, it's really important uh, because, you know, we do see that in other areas, um, you know, where either projects or, 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 or you know, either to incentivize liquidity or dumping more of the tokens onto the market, thus diluting the value of these other tokens as well. So um, I do think that is also a crucial factor in one people to recognize um, is very cool. Um, and it's interesting, how do you guys think of this concept? Because, you know, when I heard about it, this idea of, of, of a remotely- Wait, uh, hold on, Yona. I'm getting a lot of background noise right now from you. How about now? This is wonderful. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Okay, thanks. And let me know if it happens again. Um, okay. So let's go back to like non-dilutive. That's about when it started, when you no first problem. brought up that. No problem. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think a, a really important aspect of Ample, as you mentioned, is non-diluting. Non um, because, you know, there, there are other, uh, you know, types of ways of, of accomplishing, um, you know, the, 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 this idea of changing supply and demand. When, you, when you're looking at, um, a lot of these DeFi protocols that are trying to incentivize liquidity providers. So they're pretty much dumping uh, their tokens onto the market for, for free, essentially. That's then looting the value of other tokens. And so I, I do think that's really awesome 
what you guys are doing, where you figure out a way of, 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 of accomplishing this without diluting anyone's value, which is really awesome. And I think really important. My question is, how, how did you guys think of this idea? Because when I first heard of it, this idea of remotely um, adjusting the, the value that people are holding, I thought of, of, of stock splits of, you know, you know, when, when a stock value gets too high and, and, and they want to split the value, they, they split the stocks. And so if I have one Tesla stock and, and they split it, I now have two stack of Tesla uh, stocks and that happens to everyone uh, simultaneously. So that's what I thought of. Uh, how did you guys think of this idea? Um, you know, really came from thinking about um, gold and the gold standard. So when we think about assets, like I just, I, uh, the, the framing that was really, really helpful um, for us internally, in which I encourage other people to adopt externally, is that you can think of cryptocurrencies as a new generation of precious metals, almost, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, Bitcoin being a digital gold is a very clear example of that. And then you can think of DeFi is as almost this um, new generation of rudimentary banks that are being designed to kind of allow you to exchange and lend and borrow against these new precious metals, so to speak. And so that analogy is a very grounding analogy. And um, really, so when you think back to assets like gold and you ask what's wrong with gold, the answer is not a whole lot. It's actually a pretty cool asset. It's a precious metal. You can speculate on it. You know, you can use it as a check against inflation. You can use it as a bit of a refuge against these wild boom and bust cycles. You run into problems with an asset like gold, which is a fixed supply asset, when you start to build a financial ecosystem on top of it. And historically, we've done this a number of times. And this is where like our academic advisors were able to add a great deal of context as recently as you know, the period between the 40s and 70s under the Bretton Woods Agreement, we had uh, dollars that were redeemable for gold by foreign governments and central banks. Um, and you know, really in that scenario, you know, the dollar was already global reserve currency, just as it is today. And there's a great deal of demand for dollars um, because we were supplying the global economy with this currency. Um, and it got to the point where the demand for the paper dollars or greenbacks, right, uh, outpaced our ability to obtain the gold necessary to maintain that redeemability, right? Um, and uh, two things happened. One, folks, the, the price of gold skyrocketed, right? Because look, every, like they need more gold to, to, to back these dollars. They can't get more gold and, you know, therefore the value of my gold is going up. And two, people start to hold their gold rather than sell it. Right, because if you if your nugget of gold allows you to buy one refrigerator today and you expect it to be able to buy two refrigerators tomorrow, you're going to want to hold it. Um, and so the ecosystem was designed in such a way that um, at a time when we needed more gold in circulation, um, the stock of gold wasn't going to naturally increase because there's a certain amount of gold in the natural world um, that's not going to really be modified by the demand for it. And uh, folks really want to hoard and withhold gold from circulation. Um, and this puts the system, the ecosystem as a whole at risk of a deflationary spiral, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a self-reinforcing negative cycle. And that's why we ultimately had to leave the Bretton Woods standard. And thankfully we were able to move on to a pure paper money fiat standard. Um, and since then we've never looked back and, and, and economists uh, have, have very carefully dissected the pros and cons of this having happened, right? So number one, it was essential because we weren't just, we just simply weren't gonna find the gold and deflationary spiral could grind the global economy into a halt. So it wasn't really an option. You know, at some point it became clear we needed to leave that program. Um, but number two, it was um, a, a period of retrospection in, in the decades that followed to dissect, you know, what had we gained and what had we lost? Specifically what we gained was this elasticity that allows us um, as a civilization to respond to random economic shocks, supply shocks, demand shocks, people who are in control of these monetary systems can increase the supply of fiat money in response to demand, or even uh, increase the supply of money against the natural forces of, of markets, right? So for example, stimulus spending, like we've seen recently in response to you know, the lockdowns and the shut economic shutdown from COVID-19, we can actually stimulate the economy by, by like, supernaturally increasing the supply of money. And that's what we gained, the, the flexibility of elasticity. And what, what we lost though, was the discipline of a rules-based system. So now 
you know, in the past, like nobody can will more gold into existence. We can't simply say, look, it would be great if we had a lot more gold. So let it be, let there be gold. Um, that wasn't ever an option. And therefore a certain amount of discipline need to be exercised in designing systems that uh, were built upon these hard monies. Um, and, and as a result, um, the, the real dichotomy exists between like a rules-based system that has absolutely scarce supply and a discretionary system that is, um, you know, at the discretion of human decision makers, right? And the trade-off there is uh, the really people talk about bailouts and moral hazards. Like, so because you now have this ability to bail out, then uh, the game changes such that uh, the actors in this economic ecosystem, they're not, they're not actually playing a game against the forces of nature as they were with gold. They're playing a game against other people. And it's not a question of like uh, whether you'll be bailed out, but when you'll be bailed out. And so, of course, there'll be profitable decisions um, that people can make or bets that people can make that, you know, actually disrupt the system. Right. So I, I don't know, to ground this a little bit more carefully or more specifically, um, we've seen this trend of growing boom and bust cycles. Right. So every time, um, you know, the global economy requires some sort of stimulus, we see asset price inflation, right, which kicks off another kind of bubble. And, uh, you know, correspondingly, there'll be some bust. Uh, every time these busts happens, there are all these economic dislocations, like new jobs, um, jobs are lost, and generations of, of people are kind of shaped by these events. Um, and we can continue to kick the can down the road by stimulating yet again. But um, we might, in a way, be upping the stakes of the next collapse right because you can't really kick the can forever and one of the consequences this kind of paradox is best captured by this kind of dichotomy between rules and discretion and also this thing called robert triffin's dilemma and you guys can kind of look that up but i mean i think at the end of the day the economists have dissected it we moved from kind of a commodity reserve currency system to a discretionary fiat system and what we won was elasticity. What we lost was the discipline of, you know, a hard money. And so a lot of folks actually have thought about um, what if we could, what if there existed a commodity money like gold that was supply elastic, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this had almost been soft circled as like the ideal commodity reserve currency would be like gold, except for much more elastic. So when there's more demand for it, we would actually, you know, there would be more supply of it and, and vice versa. And, you know, like, so it kind of began with like James Buchanan's introduction of a kind of a rules-based monetary system. And then of course, like Friedman talked about it in commodity reserve currencies. Um, there was an early white paper in 2014 in the cryptosphere written by um, Emma Toronto that had a protocol very similar to us, though it didn't have the same context. Um, and there's an economist at the Cato Institute named George Selgin, who's actually the director of the Cato Institute, who wrote a paper called Synthetic Commodity Money that almost perfectly described this um, just in the pre-Ethereum era, where nobody would really knew how you would architect such a currency. And so yeah. when we kind of went about designing this money, we understood that the opportunity presented by blockchain technology was the creation of new commodity monies not the creation of banks. That was what was special about it. Like we've always been able to create banks since the Medici era anyways, right? Um, these kind of systems of accounting that have assets and liabilities and accept deposits and field withdrawals, banks. That's something we've been able to do for a long time. But the ability to create commodity monies like gold, that's something new to Bitcoin. And that's something very special. So when you look at upon it from that sort of perspective, it's like, of course, we should be designing these non-collateralized, irredeemable, pure cryptocurrencies that are like commodity monies, because that's the magic here. You know, people would have, you know, given a lot for this ability to create gold, right? Isaac Newton, famously obsessed with alchemy from thin air. That's the novel innovation here. Um, not the ability to create systems of accountings that, that are more like banks. And so that was the more attractive problem to solve, because it's the one that's you know, really obviously being presented, you know, by the underlying technology here. So mm -hmm. um, we wanted to create a commodity money. We knew there was all this kind of context and background behind an elastic commodity money. We came up with an implementation for it. Then we deployed it. And, and yeah, I mean, that's how we got there. Yeah. And so basically the, the, this elastic supply, 
essentially enables you to, ch to, to maintain its value. Uh, but what is that baseline? I mean, you know, originally a, 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 an ounce of gold will buy you something and a dollar will buy you something. What is that baseline for ample for or ample that you're trying to maintain? What will it buy you with, for one? Yeah, so I mean, the baseline, there's a price target, which is the CPI adjusted 2019 dollar. So one unit of ample should have the exchange rate of a 2019 dollar. So that 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 unit of account, so to speak, is also not really subject to inflation. Like when we started, it was obviously one to one because it launched mm -hmm. in 2019. But now there's already been some drift due to kind of uh, price inflation, right? And so mm -hmm. the exchange rate's now, you know, one ample to like slightly greater than one dollar. And of course, you know, over decades, it'll be more than a dollar. But um, that unit is almost a yardstick, right? It, it's a goalpost that it acts as a proxy for whether there's more demand than supply or less demand than supply not necessarily an end in itself to be fully mm -hmm. stable. Um, but um, that's, and that's one thing folks get wrong, which is why I'm trying to hit on the head. They think that because there's a price target, the whole point of this is to be stable because everybody understands what stable coins are and what they're for. Really, it's, um, it's a yardstick for determining whether there's more demand than supply or less demand than supply. Mm -hmm. And the system, what it's doing is it's propagating the volatility of demand into, the, into supply. Right. And so that also introduces value that um, a lot of folks don't yet understand. And um, what it means is that you like the whole purpose of this, when we started to, to uh, articulate it, is like we wanted to create a better building block for a future financial ecosystem. We analyzed mm -hmm. gold and we analyzed Bitcoin. We found that there, there's nothing wrong with it. There's only shortcoming. Uh, emerges when you think about it as a building block for our financial ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, the opportunity here is to design a better building block for a financial ecosystem. By having a price target, you can actually denominate contracts um, in Ample. Uh, and that's wonderful because uh, it's not something you can typically do with a non-collateralized currency. So right. for example, if you and I enter in a bet and said, like, if the Dodgers win, um, I'm going to owe you you know, um, 10 Bitcoin. Say we do yes, that. Yes, they won. I get 10 Bitcoin. <laughs> I know, right? But like, let's just say we entered that contract like a long time ago and like Bitcoin was worth like 10 bucks, right? And then they won. And at the time of that contract, um, Bitcoin was worth a thousand bucks, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what I'm on the hook for in a debt mm -hmm. denominated or a contract denominated in such a way. And let's just say like, you know, we entered that contract you were pretty confident that the Dodgers was going to win, but you weren't sure. And you're just happy with the terms of that contract. You decide to sell the option of that contract to someone else. And that person decided to repackage it into a suite of contracts and, and sell to someone else, right? Um, because of the price volatility of the contract itself, if I default, that has a cascading effect on everyone that you sold and repackaged that contract to. And that's the reason why systems like that are not very robust for uh, as building blocks for a financial ecosystem. But with Ample, right, let's just say you said, um, look, if the Dodgers win, um, you're going to pay me 10 Ample, right? Uh, let, and let's just say Ample grew tremendously, like it did this summer, right? So we grew in like 40 days from a $20 million market cap to a $1.65 billion fully diluted market cap, right? Uh, what really, but what really happened was the number of amples fluctuated far more, um, you know, greater in in a much greater way than the price of ample, right? So it ultimately kind of restabilized its price. Um, and what that means is this non-collateralized irredeemable currency can still be used for contract denomination, which is a really important quality when you think about a building block for a future financial ecosystem. I would have been far less likely to default, even though all else equal, the market cap and the gains of all holders was the same. Let's just say we 10 x you 10 x in the Bitcoin case, uh, and that would have caused risk of defaults in, in a contract. But if you 10 x in a ample case, that would not have really caused risk of default because it has a cyclical mm -hmm. price. So it's useful from a building block perspective, and that's uh, really important for an irredeemable non-collateralized currency. You might say, like, well, we can't we do that with dollars? And I would say, yes, you can, but the Well, I've I've lost I've lost the ability to hear you right now. Um, 
I, I, I heard, I, I, the last thing I heard was irredeemable dollars. Uh, can't we do that with dollars? Speak a little bit right now? Yeah. Hello? Can you hear oh, me? Now I can hear. Yeah. You, uh, last thing I heard was, can't we do that with, with dollars? Yeah. So oh, okay. um, w- one thing folks say is like, they ask me like, well, can't we do that? Can't we denominate contracts in dollars? And I say, absolutely. But the, the whole point is like to create alternatives to the dollar, like functional. Otherwise we haven't really grown the pie a whole lot. Um, the solution to all crypto problems cannot simply be to use the dollar, to use Tether, to use USDC. Right. Right. Um, we need these primitive building blocks um, that are are different. And so that's one quality. And when you pair that constructive ability um, with its ability to kind of adapt to rapid shocks in demand and in its kind of ability to kind of endure kind of these potential liquidity crisis scenarios that like Bitcoin would have faced were it to be used in a Bretton Woods-like system of gold faces, then you have a pretty interesting um, asset. Um, and a lot of folks just uh, don't ha- quite have the full context. Too many people in the space, they're like, well, it's a kind of a stable coin, um, but it's neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. Um, but to our academic advisors and people who are more versed in monetary economics, they often think that most of what's being done in crypto and DeFi is neither here nor there. But Ample is really special. It takes advantage of the ability to create new commodity monies and it's elastic and it very clearly addresses the limitation of, you know, fixed supply commodity monies like gold. Um, mm-hmm. And so and kind of bridging it, that knowledge gap, yeah. I think. Yeah. If I could jump in real quick. So, I mean, like you mentioned, it, it, it what, what gives it a, such a good value is its ability to react uh, to, to that volatility, to, to those, those big changes. But right now it rebases uh, once a day. Why not rebase in real time? Uh, well, really the main, we don't want to react too quickly. And we also want to, you know, just throw out there that like the idea that there's this quantity theory of money where that states that essentially a price difference of X percent can be offset by a supply change of X percent. Now that's something that we believe to be true in the long run. And generally it's potentially true in the long run, but it certainly isn't true in the near run. So immediately changing the supply of an asset doesn't necessarily adjust its price. And so the idea is not to overcorrect, um, but to apply a gentle pressure and to know that like to inform the market and allow the system to simply say that if there aren't enough ample be, and the price of ample is greater than a dollar, then we're going to start, you're going to see the system increase the supply of ample until mm-hmm. price comes down to a dollar. Um, the idea is not to adjust price um, too quickly because that's actually not very possible to do in in normal markets based on supply alone. And um, I don't think it's actually necessary because over time, the game theory will kind of understand that like, okay, because it has a cyclical price target, pretty much when it's a, underneath a dollar, you can buy low. And when it's over, you can kind of sell high. Um, and, and the forces of markets will start to correct that. Now, in today's world, in today's DeFi world, where we have these uh, automated market ma- making platforms like Uniswap, it is in fact the case that when you change supply, price immediately corrects itself. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do not live in an ecosystem that only relies on AMMs like Uniswap, which don't have order books, right? Those mm-hmm. have derived price from bonding curves. We also exist in a, a universe where there are centralized exchanges and the bit, you know, Ample is listed on centralized exchanges where people kind of bid across a spectrum of prices um and and in in that universe like the adjustment of supply does not necessarily immediately correspond with the change in price and so overcorrecting by rebasing too often or too aggressively might just make the system a little bit too sensitive Mm -hmm. um and so uh, we didn't really see the need for that Mm. and and you mentioned that you guys kind of set out to do was when you envisioned uh, a, a kind of a new primitive, a new baseline um, for future financial products, for this, this new world, this new idea, uh, a new way of, of, of building a financial system. Um, but I mean, DeFi, you know, with its, its big boom, DeFi's big boom is pretty recent. The big boom of, 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 of using these stable coins, so-called stable coins or, or these utility coins as collateral. Um, that then we've like we've seen in March or Black Thursday, where, where, where the, the, due to price volatility, you know, all these all these all these uh, lo- loans got liquidated, all these positions got liquidated. That problem was pretty recent, but 
but and it seems like you you guys started this uh you know building ample and ample forth before you know DeFi really took off before the big issue of having collateralized assets for loans uh came to be so d- did you guys build it for one use case and and you kind of just got really lucky that this whole giant new use case just popped up um kind of well, i think it's like it's all encompassing right so when we work mm-hmm. with folks like who who, who come from the Hoover Institute, they've analyzed money for their entire life. This is like a multi-generational thing. Like Milton Friedman was a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, Represent. right? So yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so their understanding of money is so sophisticated um, that it is kind of all encompassing. The idea of it as a collateral asset is a natural quality of money that, you know, every financial system uh, requires because you don't, mm-hmm. it doesn't really begin and end with like this asset that you can transact. You know, we do have banks and, you know, we do have bonds and we do have insurance and we do have, you know, quant trading. And so the, 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 the principles of money that what that which makes for good money and the values that go into that, you know, kind of take all these things into consideration. Now, in the case of Maker in, in particular, what you're describing is just a system that uses um, cryptocurrencies as collateral um, to produce a stable unit called DAI, right? And it relies on um, you know, a debt marketplace really to regulate the supply of DAI. And one of the things we understood early on, because we looked at a lot of designs of stable coins, um, and again, Ample is not a stable coin, it is kind of a base money, more like Bitcoin or ETH, um, but it can be used as a building block whose output uh, is something other than Ample, right? And so Uh, Systems like Maker were always very troubling for us. Um, What you describe as a recent problem, the the Black Thursday crash and collapse of that that ecosystem, so to speak, is actually a very old problem, right? So the idea that the free market um, can sustain a debt marketplace is something that we've historically proven to be false time and time again, right? So Mm -hmm. bonds are a very, very scary thing. Um, uh, the I, like presidents are scared like of bonds. Sovereign governments are scared of bonds, right? So you can't force somebody to take a debt position in um, in an asset if they don't want to. Like so, you know, no matter wh- how I price um, this contract for ETH, like you might not want to have a position in ETH. So in the case of Black Thursday, it's like, hey, the price of ETH is falling. Uh, I'm worried about getting auto liquidated you know, I need to buy some dye so I can close out my position and get my ETH back. No amount of incentive can say like, look, I want to buy a bunch of ETH, right? It can't force you to say, I want to buy a bunch of ETH and deposit in the system because we need to increase the supply of dye. The free market will not tell you to do that, right? The market force was price of ETH is falling. I want to exit. Similarly, like nobody can convince, you know, a market to buy Venezuelan bonds, you know, if they don't want to, you know, no matter how I price it, I could tell you that like, you know, the interest rate on this at maturity is going to be astronomical. You might just not want to hold a position in that bond. And that's why these debt based, these sovereign debt monies, um, they always face liquidity crises and they always require occasional bailouts. Now, Mm -hmm. systems like the U.S. dollar are great because we have so much uh, economic and political and military leverage that we're very good at bailing out, right? So, you know, the whole Keynesian view, the move to pure fiat, all of that was predicated on this kind of infallible money printing authority as kind of embodied by the United States. Um, It was designed, these debt-based monies were designed to be bailed out and to assume that there exists a sovereign authority who's very good at bailing out. When the US dollar prints more money, it, it carries value because they can force um, citizens to pay their taxes in U.S. dollars, to denominate wages in U.S. dollars, right, and to do certain deals internationally in U.S. dollars. But in a free market with these independent monetary systems, where there isn't supposed to be a sovereign monetary authority, they can't force you to do anything, right? And thus, we know a debt-based marketplace always faces liquidity crisis from time to time. We we should have known out the gate that a system like MakerDAO could never actually sustainably work um, for that reason. And, 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 you know, this played out, you know, exactly according to our expect- expectations, though not on the timeline that we expect. I thought it was going to take longer for this to happen. Yeah. Um, a sharp decline uh, caused, you know, this kind of liquidity crunch, right? There wasn't enough dye to go around. 
which caused the price of dye to go up. Um, people wanted to purchase a bunch of dye specifically so they could destroy dye by closing out their positions. And that was at a time when the world needed more. Okay, so when, when the world needed more and more dye, when the system needed more and more dye, the incentive was to buy it and remove it from the ecosystem because really the supply of dye was being regulated by the demand for ETH, not the demand for dye. Um, now, I think um, there's just a lot of, lot of things to unpack there, but the big one here is the idea that we can recreate the central banking system on the blockchain or a sovereign debt money on the blockchain is, is kind of false altogether. And so then you see makers start to collateralize with USDC. And that's the ultimate kind of, um, I, I mean, way to ensure the stability of the system, but it's kind of a cop out, right? So it's like, if, if your decentralized stable coin is, is using a centralized stable coin as collateral, then that's self-defeating as well. So, I right. mean, the rise of dollars in the DeFi ecosystem is kind of um, discouraging from a, you know, I guess more philosophical perspective because we are trying to create an alternative financial ecosystem that exists outside the influence of politics. And, you know, so often the solution to our problems has simply been to use Tether or USDC and the MakerDAO system had to do that as well. But what's troubling is the fact that um, it wasn't recognized that it, that was inevitable when we've seen it happen time and time and time again, historically, you know, uh, yeah, so it, it does seem like what Ample provides is this, uh, not a stable, not a stable coin, but stability to a market um, because it's able to adjust, because it's elastic. But I mean, doesn't, don't we at a certain, uh, and I'm going to go way over my head and try to jump into economics with you, but, but um, it, isn't, isn't, you know, speculation, debt markets, doesn't, isn't this part, a, a part of a whole, of a healthy whole economy necessary? I mean, are, doesn't a certain amount of debt allow one to create more value than they currently have. Uh, you know, if I have a great idea for a business and I want to go uh, and I don't have the money to start it, I, I go to bank, I take on debt um, uh, to, to then be hopefully be able to create more value than the debt I took out and I can repay it and, and I've created more value in the world. So um, yeah, are, totally. are these all necessary parts of a functioning uh, economy? Yes. So everything you said, I agree with, right? So I think speculation is important, right? Um, it create, it's like, it adjusts risk. It shifts risk and reward profiles around in such a way that helps people diversify their potential earnings, right? To make more use of their time in a way, right? By leveraging their assets um, to do more with what they have and create value. And so I do think um, these things are very important. Um, and so I don't think that debt is necessarily a bad thing. Um, I, and I also think that, you know, the second part of what, or I don't think speculation is a bad thing and I don't think debt is a bad thing. So the question from a speculation perspective is like cryptocurrencies are primarily used for speculation today. Yeah. What does all of that energy bootstrap for us? All of that speculative energy, you know, what is that bootstrapping for us? In the case of Bitcoin, the speculation bootstrapped liquidity of a hard money, which now is you know, has the potential for use as a store of value and a potential digital gold in the long run. And, and we know that uh, things like gold uh, and therefore digital gold have very well understood economic uh, functions. So a check against inflation, a check against boom and bust cycles. These are big deal use cases for gold that most people um, kind of don't really want to hear about because they're like, why do I need that? Why do I need that? It's a big deal though, right? The market cap of gold is in the trillions. Therefore, Bitcoin has the potential to grow to fill that role. And, and this is the function of precious metals has been for a very long time. Um, so that all that speculative energy bootstraps um, a alternative to commodity money that can be extremely valuable, and creates a lot of optionality in the global macro economy, right? Mm -hmm. um, so speculation is good. We just want to have our you know, eye on like, where is it taking us? Like, what is mm -hmm. the outcome of, of this speculative energy? What are we harnessing here to create better? Um, and, and in the case of debt, yes, debt is powerful. I mean, I forgot, I think it was Keynes that said that debt should be ex like cheap, but difficult to get. So um, <laughs> when, when, when it's, when the criteria for getting debt is difficult, um, it means like the person or whatever, the system that's granting you this debt contract is kind of fairly confident that you're going to be able to repay it. Um, and when debt is cheap, it means like you're not paying exorbitant interest, which means that like, okay, this person who 
likely will repay this debt contract is going to get access to money, capital at a reasonable interest rate. What do we think is going to happen in that scenario? Well, we think this person is going to create a lot of economic value. The person who can pay back their debts suddenly chooses to take on debt and who isn't get, getting kind of fleeced on interest rates is probably going to create some jobs, goods, services, economic value. Um, now, if in DeFi, it's flipped upside down right now. And I haven't fully made conclusive arguments about this one way or another, but it seems to be that debt is very expensive and easy to get the opposite, right? So anybody can can take a margin position, can, can basically leverage their position, um, but at an exorbitant rate, right? You have to fully collateralize what and more, right? Over collateralize. Over collateralize, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A contract in order to get your, you know, borrowed money at a very high interest rate, a high variable interest rate for that matter. So it's not something you would do if you're going to buy a house. Like, okay, if I want to buy a million dollar house, let me throw down 2 million <laughs> and pay like, you know, 20% interest and I'll be able to buy the house. It's not something that quite makes sense for long-term use cases. It's something that makes sense for a short-term low leverage margin trade. Um, and so that form of debt um, just amplifies risks a little bit and also nothing terribly wrong with it, but I wouldn't argue that it creates a ton of kind of economic value. It might just create more risk optionality. Um, and, and that's also not a terrible thing, but I, I think that um, p these things should be well understood and nothing about Ample is kind of prohibiting that. So mm -hmm. we wanna be on lending platforms because actually it's really useful to use um, Ample for debt denomination because of the cyclical price target. It's abstracting the volatility of market cap demand for Ample from the stability of a contract denominating in Ample. And so it's not a stable asset. It can't be because it's um, it's not collateralized and it's so young and early in the space, right? It's not a stable asset. You can speculate on it. It's still 100 extra money or lose all your money, right? But it facilitates the construction of stable contracts today, mm -hmm. Right, that's the ecosystem building quality of it. And in a way that doesn't require that we use US dollars. And thus far, I think the lesson is like, anytime somebody's promised you an alternative to the US dollar that's here and now and useful today, it's, it's kind of turned out to be a false promise. So the beauty of MakerDAO was that it said like, look, it's just like the central bank system, except for instead of leaving the decisions to the discretionary of a few people, we're gonna, we're gonna leave the decisions to the discretion of a community of people, a decentralized internet community. And that sounds really great. But the missing puzzle piece was the US kind of debt-based so debt sovereign money. It functions because it is a sovereign authority with a military, economic, political presence, and it can print money that carries value, bailout money. It's very good at printing bailout money because it can force use as a global reserve currency and for taxes and for wages, right? Because the MakerDAO system and things like that cannot force use for wages, um, taxes, you know, things like that. And it isn't very good at bailing itself out, right? Its equivalent would be like to issue more MKR token. But if nobody wants to buy your MKR token, the value of MKR token just goes down and it can only bail itself out so much, whereas the US can bail itself out a lot, right? And so systems like that um, debt is good, right? Speculation is good, um, but building a, a, a monetary stable unit on top of the infrastructure that we have today is really, really impossible and premature. So I guess this is a long-winded way of saying that like, I don't think the leverage is bad. I don't think the speculation is bad. I don't think the lending and borrowing is bad. What I think is bad is when we believe that we can take that system and produce like, um, fundamental use cases that could challenge the dollar, right? And that ought to be used to serve, you know, the unbanked, right? Shouldn't the, un the unbanked just need banks, right? They don't need crypto necessarily. They need any sort of banking service. And they want, they should have access to, you know, stable currency, but, you know, um, I don't know that the MakerDAO is necessarily the solution to that. Um, it might as well be USDC, right? right. So um, yeah, I, I again, Nothing wrong with any of those things. I think it's just uh, expectation and reality. We, we thought we could create a challenger to the US dollar today, but we can't. Um, and it's the same with the Bitcoin standard folks where they're just like, well, why can't we just create a new standard on top of Bitcoin? Um, you know, it's so much more divisible than gold. Uh, couldn't, we, couldn't we solve the problem that way and challenge the US dollar again? 
Um, yeah, and, and unfortunately, also, no. And, and yeah, they, they both they both exist. I mean, listen, yeah, like you're you're not you're not uh, excluding any of these other cryptos. You're just offering, you know, uh, what you view as 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 a as an awesome financial product and tool and 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 uh, an elastic commodity. And um, and I appreciate you taking the time before you go because we're almost out of time. Um, you know, this is the Halloween special, so I'd, I'd like to hear what is your scariest crypto story. My scariest crypto story. I I don't know if I have a super scary like specific script crypto story, but I, I am concerned a little bit in this post Trump era of like telling people what they want to hear, like is how to win. Right. That's kind mm -hmm. of the world that we live in. I worry that that's just been happening again and again and again in the crypto marketplace. And each time that happens, like, you know, speculative bubbles emerge and then, um, you know, money is lost and people are jaded as a result of this. Like, so, you know, I think that that phenomenon concerns me in a way like we had such a hard time explaining the motivation for ample and other folks had such an easy time explaining the motivation for their monetary designs or their protocol designs and turns out all the folks that had an easy time explaining what they were doing um ended up promising something that was impossible to deliver right oh the utility token thing the security token thing like we can create a challenger to the us dollar today through you know debt-based marketplace there's all things that people wanted to hear. They all turn out to be wrong, right? Bitcoin was something that nobody really understood and wanted to hear for a long time. It kind of turns out to be right. Um, so I, I worry that like, you know, um, in a universe where like telling people what they want to hear actually results in financial gain, um, what we'll end up making as a community of developers and what mistakes we'll end up unnecessarily repeating um so well, yeah I, I appreciate it in this world where you know there is a danger of people just saying what they want to hear i appreciate you taking the time to tell us what we need to hear and also creating something that potentially we will need uh especially yeah. if the government keeps on printing more and more dollars we're gonna we're gonna want something that's tied to the 2019 dollars uh when you know when uh, the 2020 dollar is, is is printed again and again so evan thank you so much for joining us uh taking the time to really giving, you know, explaining, it's not an easy uh, a thing that you made. And it's not a simple thing because it, it, doesn't des it doesn't deserve a simple solution to a complex problem. So I appreciate you taking the time to help explain to us and our viewers. So uh, thank you for that. And for all our viewers at Reimagine 2020, I'm Yona Hockhauser. Thanks for watching.